Hello everyone, my name is Emmeline Foster and I'm the Executive Director of the French American Foundation in New York City. I have the pleasure of welcoming you to a special Zoom webinar this afternoon in collaboration with the Academic Partnership Program Alliance between Columbia University, Sciences Po, Ecole Polytechnique and Paris 1 Panthéon Sorbonne University. Thank you to Dr. Ferragina and Dr. Piver for being with us today. For those of you joining us for the first time, the French American Foundation's webinar series is an opportunity to engage our broader community in dialogue surrounding questions of mutual interest for both sides of the Atlantic. With the growth of protest movements and the backdrop of COVID-19 and racial injustice, today's webinar is no exception. Our speakers this afternoon needs very little introduction for many of you listening in. Emmanuele Ferragina and Frances Fox Piven are at the forefront of academic research in their respective fields. I am delighted to introduce Emmanuele this afternoon, who will follow with an introduction of Frances Fox Piven. This is the second time we are welcoming Emmanuele at, at FAF. And the first time he made quite an impact, an impact on our uh, American participants talking about le, this social movement, Les Gilets Jaunes. Emmanuelle Ferragina is Associate Professor of Sociology at Sciences Po Paris, a member of the Observatoire Sociologique du Changement and the Laboratoire Interdisciplinaire d'Evaluation des Politiques Publiques. Prior to Sciences Po, he was a lecturer at the University of Oxford, where he also received his PhD. Emmanuel is interested in comparative social policy. Besides academia, he has established the think tank Fonderia Oxford. He is a columnist for the Italian newspaper Il Fatto Quotidiano, and he has appeared in several Italian political talk shows on issues related to the welfare state and inequality. Last year, he was a visited, visiting Alliance Cola at Columbia University. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to our speakers. Thank you again so much for being with us today. Um, thanks a lot, Emmeline, for the very kind uh, uh, introduction. And, you know, I'm, I'm very glad to be here today and, and, and to be in conversation with Professor Francis Fox Piven. Uh, which for me, as a, as a scholar of the welfare state, has been a much inspiration of uh, a lot of things that I've studied. Um, I, I want to introduce her with, uh, you know, I mean, I think you can uh, 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 look by yourself all the accolades and the, and the magnificent work that Professor Piven has done. But for me, I just would like to introduce her with, with I think, that the one thing that I've learned uh, from her. So when I was a young undergraduate student at the University of Turin, uh, I happened to find a copy of Regulating the Poor uh, that the professor gave to me uh, in order to tell me, look, you know, you've always been studying the welfare state in a very traditional way, studying, you know, uh, policy programs in Europe about labor market inequality. Now it's time for you uh, to understand more critically uh, what, what the welfare state means. And, uh, and he gave me uh, 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 this copy of Regulating the Poor uh, which was a book that was published first time in 1971, but I think it was a book that was really ahead of its time uh, because a lot of the changes that we've been seeing in the transformation of the welfare state and in the linkage between how welfare state is used and the relationship between labor capital and life of ordinary people unfold uh, has been uh, 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 described by, by Professor Cloward and Professor Piven uh, in greater depth. So, you know, I, I, I think introducing Professor Spiven is, is very hard, for, you know, being, you know, taking an approach of saying everything she has written. So, you know, I just wanted to share with you my personal uh, gratitude uh, for what I've learned for her and just uh, leave to her the floor uh, for her intervention. Well, my, my work is mainly about movements in American politics and also about the American welfare state and the intersection between movements and the American welfare state. Uh, this is therefore a very important moment for me because the United States at right now in the last couple of weeks is undergoing the experience of a kind of pervasive, deep, 
and huge protest movement such as has never occurred in American history. This is quite amazing. This is a protest movement that is not located in West Coast and East Coast cities. Rather, it has spread everywhere in the country and it includes, and this also is very amazing, with nothing comparable in American history, it includes representatives, people who are black, brown, and lots of white people. There has never been a movement, there have been movements that have had sort of spurs that were interracial. But this movement is profoundly, deeply interracial and inclusive. And I don't think anybody would dare to say where it, where it is going to lead, how it is going to be reabsorbed into normal American politics, but it's going to be different. This movement is going to change the country. Now, I think a lot of people who are observers of American politics are in a sense holding their breath, trying to understand the movement, its sources, and the directions it can conceivably take. But I, the first kind of question that movement scholars usually ask has to do with the events, changes in society, which precipitate the movement? What are the causes of the movement? And here I think you have to under, you, ha you have to look very closely, not only at the sort of classical and long-standing grievances of black Americans, because black Americans have been the symbolic center of the movement, even though they have not been the dominant participants in the movement. So it, it does have to do with black grievances and especially the long-standing conflict between local police and black people because local police are the agents that maintain order in, a, in our very unequal and increasingly unequal society. Uh, this, this conflict between police and black and brown people is very long standing. So it has to do not only with that conflict coming to a head once again, as it did in the 1960s, as it did in the early 1990s, uh, but it also has to do with the capture of the national government by the right-wing, increasingly right-wing Republican Party, increasingly extremist, increasingly bizarre uh, set of characters who now represent the sort of fabled American democracy. I think that, in other words, the, the great movement, which is now, has now unfolded in the United States and which may very well transform American society certainly minimize the influence of neoliberalism. That movement is owed significantly to the very victories and to the style, the irresponsible style of the right-wing Republican Party that has gained control of all branches of American government. So when I say that this is a great movement, a huge movement, I mean that partly in terms of the usual measures of movement scale, movement significance, the numbers of participants, the numbers of people arrested, the numbers of people who are hospitalized, uh, by all those sort of classical measures, this is a huge movement. But it is also distinctive for its 
for, for the scope of participation in the movement and for public support of the movement. Uh, most Americans approve of the movement, no matter that its main slogan is Black Lives Matter. That's okay. People have adopted this movement and treat it as their own. So, we have to wonder, I think, where the movement can go. And the pl first place it has gone and will go is, I think, in its impact on electoral politics in the United States. You know, we have a kind of a mini tradition, those of us who study movements, in which we separate uh, protest politics from electoral politics. We study, we have scholars who study movements and we have scholars who study elections. And we do not pay enough attention to the interplay between electoral politics and movement politics, which I have always thought have a lot to do with each other. Uh, and I think that we are going, we are going to see that in the 2020 elections in the United States. Trump is falling rapidly behind in the contest with the Democratic candidate. Now, this is a kind of tense moment in the United States, not because we don't know if Trump or Biden or the Republicans, the crazy Republicans, and they have gone berserk. I have a sort of pr uh, private theory about why that is, uh, that they see um, th they're too much influenced by the fossil fuel industry, which sees that they can't take it all out of the ground. They can't realize their wealth. And they're too much influenced by the reckless financial industry, but no matter, whatever the reasons that the Republican Party has become an extremist party, they are an extremist party, they are. And they're going to be, def def they would be defeated in the November election if the votes are counted and reported. We don't know if that will happen in the United States. So we have another thing, another kind of awesome spectacle before us, and that is the spectacle of a major election being stolen outright. It could happen, we don't know. The Trump crowd shows a ready willingness to lie about everything, it has overseen uh, a pandemic which has cost many, many American lives. And Donald Trump still boasts about not wearing a mask. I mean, can you imagine anything so petty in its vanity? Uh, the, but the Trump crowd could refuse to acknowledge an, the, the vote count in November. That is very easily within their capacity and consistent with their past behavior. We don't know. And we don't know what, what, what kinds of resistance are possible. Now, the one cheering development of late is that the as Trump declines in the public opinion polls, there is the possibility that he will lose the election so massively that stealing it is beyond his daring, is beyond their daring. Uh, but we don't know, we don't know for sure. So, there we are. I don't think that there has ever been a moment in American politics, to my knowledge, 
that has, where so much has been at stake, where so many of the people have been engaged in the unfolding crisis, and where the world, the globe, all of our worlds hang on the consequences of the unfolding of the movements in American politics and the unfolding of electoral politics as well. Thank you. I think I'll 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 take the uh, the follow up from this. So first of all, thanks a lot, Professor Piven, for a very good introduction about uh, uh, what's happening in the U.S. and the power of the movement. What, what I would like to try to do is is to try to go more on the structural phenomenon that I observe. And I think that they put this movement that we see at the forefront in the US as, as something that has a lot to do as well with what we are observing in Europe and, and about the structural causes of this, um, of this movement. So if, if you pass me the very simple and, and, and sort of cheesy metaphor, uh, we need to distinguish the trigger from, from, uh, from the long standing pressures within uh, within the system. And if you want, uh, the killing of George Floyd has been uh, a very powerful trigger. Now, uh, if you look at, at, at events and killings and, you know, uh, many of these occurrences happen uh, uh, with American police and in many other European countries every day. But the images of the killing of George Floyd, in a sense, have been, you know, uh, very, very cruel, very strong, but have also happened in an environment that was already a uh, stroke uh, uh, by a long-term economic crisis, and I, I will go to that in a minute, uh, and also happened at the, you know, at the moment of this pandemic uh, uh, that has sparked a lot of uh, uh, hate debate into the public opinion, especially in the United States, where I think we can uh, affirm uh, 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 that this crisis has been a bit mismanaged uh, in comparison to many, many, other, many other countries. So what is happening? I mean, how, how do I observe uh, uh, that at the structural level? Well, I mean, if you look at the economy over the last uh, uh, three or four decades, uh, um, I think three uh, uh, tendencies uh, unify Europe and the United States, and three tendencies have been even more advanced in the United States than have been in Europe. The first is, is wage stagnation, uh, but not only for the lower classes, but also for the middle classes. Over the last three or four decades, and this, you know, I, I partially approached this team already last year, whatever you think about it, uh, uh, the income uh, uh, level of the American middle classes have been, uh, uh, have been stagnating, meaning that the economic system uh, doesn't distribute uh, anymore uh, uh, to the middle classes as it used to do in the past. A second phenomenon is the increased level of precariousness uh, 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 in terms of the labor market, which of course eats uh, uh, more strongly ethnic minorities, women, uh, young people, and people with lower levels of education. And finally, uh, uh, the system as it works has progressively increased polarization of wealth and income uh, across the labor force. So, so we observe three phenomena in the way lower and middle classes observe wage stagnation and labor market precariousness, where people uh, at the very top observe uh, uh, an incredible increase of their wealth and a progressive reduction of the taxation. Uh, my reading of the situation, whatever, you, you know, you might disagree with my interpretation of the structural phenomenon and thinking that I'm exaggerating in my analysis, but one fact uh, cannot be denied, and, and this fact I share for a second my screen to just show you a graph. Well, this is a normalized figure that charts uh, uh, what has been happening in terms of strikes uh, over the last three decades. Uh, one line is the United States, the red line. One line is the United Kingdom, one line is France, uh, the blue one, uh, uh, green is Italy, and yellow is Spain. What you observe after the 2008 crisis is that social conflict has increased by any measure. So uh, uh, you might not agree with the fact uh, that the economy is going so badly, but we certainly know that all kinds of grievances have been increasing, okay? So I think, uh, 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 this movement that we observe today comes up in a, in a, in a turning point uh, uh, for the economic system that has been already highly conflicted over the last, uh, over the last uh, few, uh, few decades. Um, so the escalation of the conflict, you know, uh, we, we've been discussing a little bit about the US. This is very clear in France. 
it has been very clear in France over the last couple of years. We had the Gilets jaunes protest, of which we already discussed last year. We had a lot of protests here about the reform of old age pension. I mean, the tube hasn't worked in Paris for a month and a half, uh, uh, pretty much. Uh, a huge contestation on labor market reforms, huge contestation even on reform or research. So people are, are in a way, uh, uh, very ready to conflict uh, with the system about economic distribution and, and widely shared reform on the work state. What is the role of the police into that? And that's the thing where it is interesting, why, why the target of the police is so important and why, for example, uh, uh, the American protesters are asking for reducing or actually slashing uh, financement for police forces, which is of course also linked to incarceration and other, and other issues. Well, the point is, as, as, as Professor Piven has, has said before, is that the police is there uh, uh, to defend a certain social order. Now, if this social order doesn't distribute any more to the majority of the population, is of course put under question more and more. And of course, the incidences of conflict between the police and protesters are going to increase, and they've been increasing uh, over the last over the last ten years in major uh, Western countries. Uh, my point is, it's not only an opposition here between protesters and the police. Uh, because very often policemen, as far as I observe uh, economic reality, they're not members of the upper class, certainly. But they're, of course, a tool of management of, of a class war that is going on. And to me, what I've observed in the US, but you know, I'm happy to discuss that in, in the Q&A, the clear attempt of the police force is to divide the protests and the grievances of Afro-American people from the one of the white middle class. Because this is the explosive cocktail when movements became very dangerous uh, for the established order. Uh, it is exactly when lower classes, who have, of course, uh, uh, the highest number of grievances, meet up with a white middle class that has been losing ground a lot uh, uh, for this wage stagnation. And this, you know, uh, to go back to what I was telling you before about uh, wage stagnation, labor market precariousness, and polarization of wealth. And why the system is contributing to an increasing polarization of wealth? Well, this is to favor a financial sector that is more and more detached from real economics. You know, I would like, probably there are people in the audience who know that better than me, but how is it possible uh, uh, that the stock market is doing very well after all we have observed over the last couple of months and two months and a half? You know, it, 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 it's clearly hard to reconcile with the vision of the economics, a real economics that we observe uh, on the ground. And so I come to the conclusion of this intervention by saying, uh, um, I agree with Professor Spiven that we are a very historical turning point. I don't know what this movement is going to bring. I don't know what other movements are going to bring uh, around Europe. But we are certainly at a point in which a certain economic system that has already been heavily affected uh, with the 2008 crisis, but has been having a declining profitability over time, uh, we need a fix. Okay. We need a fix, and, and this opens uh, uh, to a new opportunity for discussion of this uh, political fix, because the resolution of the crisis cannot be economical, it needs to be political and social, huh? importantly. I think I want to emphasize, it needs to be social and respond to the pressure that are coming from below. How this is gonna happen, uh, you know, uh, 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 on this I will close by using Karl Polanyi. We are certainly experiencing a societal counter movement faced to a system that is trying to commodify to an extreme the labor force. But what is gonna happen, you know, we don't know. Are we gonna see uh, a rise in protectionism as, you know, uh, Trump in many ways has been uh, proposing? Are we gonna see the system trying to hold on as for example, Macron has been trying to do in France? Are we gonna see popular protests and progressive movements uh, uh, finally managing to propose more redistribution and change in a sense uh, 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 what we've been observing over the last over the last four decades, I don't know. But the only thing uh, I'm clear about, and I think we should be discussing, is about the opening of this window of opportunity. And window of opportunity doesn't mean progressive change in itself, but it means change and profound change from a social, political, and economic uh, point. Well, there have been glimmers of I think deep change in the United States. They have not risen to the forefront yet, but the uh, 
one of the developments that made the extreme polarization of income and wealth in the United States possible was the shrinking and the shriveling and the twisting of institutions that had modified uh, the extreme expressions of capitalism, including the welfare state. Welfare state was uh, hammered at and brutalized by both Republicans and Democrats in power in the United States. The attack on unions so that fewer and fewer people had the protection and the social support of unions in the United States. And then the transformation of the political party in the US that had for 50 years or more been the party of working people, the Democratic Party became more and more the party of Wall Street, not the party of fossil fuels, but the party of Wall Street. These changes, in a sense, strip people of the protective uh, support, both the material supports and the protective ideological and social supports of important institutions. In a sense, the vehicles for legitimation collapsed under the assault of aggressive neoliberal capitalism in the US. And that's where we are now. So in the last couple of years, there have been substantial efforts to reclaim the Democratic Party as the party of working people. And the rise of Bernie Sanders as a potential Democratic candidate for president is sort of a symbol of that effort. Uh, it wasn't the whole of it. There were many other efforts to reform the Democratic Party, to take it back, so to speak, and to reclaim its New Deal heritage. So is, does that suggest a path for solving the problem of economic polarization, inequality, rising poverty, which are the essential uh, characteristics of the system that we have become. What do you think? I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I acknowledge, um, well, I mean, uh, then, then we can go more in detail into that. I, I clearly acknowledge, and I found very interesting this idea that in the idea of Bernie Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez, there's a lot of re recall of, of, of the idea of new deals, uh, increased minimum wages, which basically means, you know, we need to reprotect labor against capital. Uh, it, it was almost, almost in a sort of uh, primordial uh, a socialist uh, tradition. And I mean, in Europe, we've been observing movements of this kind. What I don't know, and what I'm pessimistic about a bit, is how much the disruption that we have seen of social democracy, I mean, you're talking a lot about the democratic parties, but I mean, in Europe, we have seen a total destructuration of former communist party, social democratic party, where people have totally accepted uh, liberalization of labor market policies and, 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 and the welfare state. So, I mean, I don't know how strong uh, uh, this view could be uh, 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 to, to be taken off in, in a window of opportunity, but it, it could happen. And I mean, the fact that Bernie Sanders has been running in primary election with chances to win the Democratic Party was unthinkable uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So, I mean, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not denying, I'm not denying it. I, I'm just, you know, I, I, I don't know, but I, I observe also a lot of movements, the new proposals coming back on this idea of protecting labor, uh, which is, you know, I think uh, the core of, of the problem we have observed when we talk about wage stagnation and all these things, that that's what it exactly means. It means that the share of capital and wealth uh, it became more protected and important and yeah, across all uh, uh, Western countries and many developing, uh, many developing uh, economies. So it, it could happen. And I mean, I, I, and I think movements accumulate their forces. I think this is something we haven't said and probably it is important to say in the direction of of, 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 of talking about uh, uh, progressive changes that in a way, uh, what has happened with Occupy Wall Street, what is happening today, whatever happens to these movements, they build up forces. They modify the common sense of people. Um, uh, in many ways, you know, 10, even five years ago, uh, people were very 
uh, uh, don't think that the system can change in any way. And today uh, you have protesters who ask uh, to reduce financing for police in the United States. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, uh, we need to acknowledge how workers uh, 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 in this process can come back at the forefront of the preoccupations uh, uh, that are gathered around. If this is gonna condense in a new political proposal, I don't know. Well, I think it already has condensed in new po political proposals in the United States. Uh, maybe they're not new enough because they harken back so strongly to the New Deal. Uh, but, you know, the New Deal was not realized. It made a lot of promises and it created, it, it, it delineated a perspective on how you could organize a capitalist society uh, and ensure also that you preserved democracy and that you uh, protected people from the worst brutalities of capitalism. The New Deal had a way of doing that. They didn't, it didn't unfold as completely as it should have, but it certainly left its mark on the Amer American uh, political culture. Uh, as evidenced by the fact that it's being pulled back so strongly now. Now, it's also true that there are big glimmers of this kind of development in Europe, certainly in England, with the rise, temporary rise of Corbyn as an alternative to uh, new labor, uh, which is like new Democrats in the United States means really a democratic party that has been penetrated and dominated by banking interests primarily. Uh, so the, and there's another development that's very important. We have to talk about it. And that is the Green New Deal. There's a, I think, serious and influential effort to expand the vision of the New Deal, which was a social, imagined capitalism modified by social democracy, to expand that vision into a sustainable economy, the vision of a sustainable economy uh, that would prevent the extinction of the species that would preserve our air and our temperature and so forth. And that also has, seems to have uh, legs, as we say in the United States. Uh, and I think we haven't heard the last of it. If, if the Democrats, Biden, win the next election, well, they're gonna win it. If they legally claim the presidency, if they succeed in claiming the presidency and the Senate of the United States, I think that these are the issues that are gonna dominate American politics for several years at least. Um, yeah, well, I, I think that as well. The point is how, how, this, is gonna, how this is gonna unfold and, and this, you know, it's, it's, it's very complicated to say, but certainly these items are now back into the agenda. This, you know, on this, I, I agree with you. These items were not in the democratic agenda before, and now they are. And this is an effect of all this of all these campaigns. Um, uh, Professor Piven, we got some questions from the from people who are listening to us. I don't know. I, I I just read that, so I think we can all benefit from that. And the question is, what role does a universal basic income play in all this? Have you seen more support for this concept in recent months? Um, I think we have. Uh... And, you know, it, basic income is the same as the idea of the guaranteed income, which became briefly popular in the United States in the 1960s. And the guaranteed income is really not so far afield from a comprehensive uh, set of welfare state protections, which would also protect income. Uh, so, Yes, basic income has uh, gotten, I think, a new life as a result of both the political crisis, uh, the pandemic, and the collapse of the economy, 
which the pandemic caused. And And there are problems with the basic income that I think we have to we, we have to solve. Some of them are technical problems. Some of them are cultural problems. Working people are uncomfortable with the idea of a guaranteed basic income. A lot of working people are uncomfortable with the idea uh, because we are so deeply imprinted with the conviction that work, the compulsion to work, the need to work is necessary for our, for our redemption. It's religiously necessary. It's humanly necessary. And we, we, have, we, we don't know how to think of life accepting in terms of the compulsion to work and maybe reducing the compulsion modestly, for example, with the eight hour day or free forms of that nature. But so I think we have to, we have to in a sense do cultural work uh, as well as political work in order to pave the way for a basic income. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think, you know, basic income has been, you know, over, over this crisis has been a lot debated. I, I have a long standing interest in basic income as, as an alternative means of income support related to the welfare state or, you know, changing uh, dramatically, shifting uh, uh, the idea we have, uh, we have about social protection. What I found interesting, another thing that I want to emphasize a little what Professor Piven has said, is that Basic income is actually very linked to the idea of environmental protection. There's a fantastic book by, by, um, uh, by a writer that many people ignore today called Andre Goltz. Uh, 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 his idea was that basically the, the, the fundamental reason for having a basic income is that we all share a planet and we all share a part of what is produced out of this planet. Now, the, the idea is very subversive, if you want, from, from an intellectual point of view, because I think it's there is not only merit, there is the idea that we need to share what we have because if people can exploit a natural resource to produce something, they're exploiting something that belongs to everybody, okay? So this is completely different from the idea of privatization that we have today of the market. So the idea of merit and the idea that people can make gains or whatever they want using nature, using workers, using all factors that we observe in the planet. So, uh, some of the conception of the basic income is very philosophical, and in this I agree with what Professor Piven was saying. We shouldn't think about the basic income as something that replaces work, uh, but one could think, and, 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 you know, and people theorize uh, uh, this idea of basic income, but Andre Gors, people like Ivan Illich, you know, th th there is a lot of interesting critical thinking around that. Uh, and then Guy Standing, Philippe Van Paris. The idea is that we share the planet, we need to share some of it, and if this can come at reducing the compulsion to work, the fatigue of work and open up in a society in which people can enjoy more what we produce collectively, then the basic income is a good support for that. Then there are technical problems. What is the level? There are problems of acceptability. What does it mean, the basic income? What it means for productivity? Uh, uh, that, have to be, that have to be discussed. But the idea that income needs to be supported and the reasons why the income needs to be supported, I think that during this COVID crisis, have uh, have been showing up. Uh, uh, very, very clearly. But this is not alternative uh, to me to the fact that we need to support uh, 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 people's wages uh, and, 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 and allow uh, for the ordinary worker to make a, a, a good living out of, his, uh, uh, out of his work. So, you know, basic income is a kind of uh, 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 a parallel tool and, uh, and, and, then, and then instrument. Uh, oh, we have another question. Uh, I read that, Professor Piven, if you're fine. So, uh, in France, where there's been a RME, so minimum, well, minimum, c'est uh, un revenu minimum dans ce sens. So, the RME, the French RME, is not a basic, is, it's not a, a minimum basic income. But I, I will go into that. I, I'll just read the question as it is. So, in France, where there has been a R, RMI, so France doesn't have a basic income. Huh? It, it has helped, but at the same time, it has maintained people in a form of precarity different than what we know in the US. We do not have a healthcare. So does basic income really work if it only maintains people in precarity or allows the government to pursue automation and outsourcing and therefore no chance for people 
uh, to get anything else than basic income. I think um, uh, here we need to clarify a bit of terms. So what the France has, the LME, it's, uh, uh, it's a revenue minimum necessary. So people have been in long-term unemployment, they are further supported by the state in order to you know, get out of the state of long-term unemployment. So in a sense, there is a, a social assistance level that is there for helping our people who are in deep difficulty. The basic income is very different. The idea of the basic income is the universal income for everybody. Uh, for every person, and it's a share of the total income of the country. So, so the idea is totally universal. While these policies you mentioned in your question are uh, uh, residual policies of, of simple help and income, and income support. So we cannot uh, say that the effect of these policies are the effects of the basic income. Uh, would have. Second point, uh, um, it's, it's not income assistance that leave people under precarity, but if people are in precarious position, it's mostly because of the labor market. If we, if we move ourselves back uh, to the 1960s, unemployment rates were very low. Precarity on the labor market was much lower than it was today, and this was not an effect of, of the welfare state. Uh, 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 this was an effect of how the relationship between capital and labor were operating on the labor market. So thinking that a policy can generate precarity by itself, uh, it's, I think, I think to me is a little bit is a little bit um, is a little bit overstretching uh, uh, the concept. Then on the fact, and uh, you mentioned the healthcare there, that we, we might want to prefer services in a welfare state over cash transfers, then the discussion could be open, right? Because you might want to argue, I don't want to end up just money to people, but I want to give to people the possibility to get things that allow them to fully access society free childcare, free healthcare, uh, uh, um, uh, social housing, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So we, we could discuss on if, if the best way of protecting people is by giving them money and immigrant and all this kind of stuff or by giving them services. But I think we need to uh, uh, understand the, 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 the feature of the discussion and comparing the American with the French welfare state on that is very complicated because in the US, I will not even talk about a welfare state, but. Uh, it's the level of protections that are completely different and the effect of the social protection is very different. One last point. It is true that in France, the structure of social protection has determined a lot of dependency uh, from people, but just because the welfare state, it's, you know, it's, it's called a Bismarckian welfare state. It's a very corporatist welfare state. So people get attached to that and fragmented. And the level of support is not very universal and given across as it used to happen uh, in other countries, not anymore. Uh, not much anymore, even in Scandinavian countries. I don't know if, if you want to add up something about social protection, relationship between, you know, minimum social assistance and basic income and, and, and so forth. Well, I think that uh, most advocates of a basic income do not mean that a basic income should be an alternative to a national health care uh, program or some kind of national health insurance, or it's not an alternative to a childcare uh, system which allows uh, men and women, but mainly women, because women are the child carers in our society, uh, the freedom to work and to not work. Uh, and nobody means it as the alternative to education, because we do believe that as a society, we have a responsibility. We want the responsibility of designing the educational system for future generations. So I think it's something of a kind of red herring. Some people who are opposed to basic income uh, say that, oh, it means that all the other uh, na na national uh, social welfare programs will be jeopardized. We. I mean, we're talking about a program we're, we're going to design, right? We're going to design it in, uh, in the wake of democratic movements that make their demands and exert pressure. So we have to include in, the, in those democratic movements a conception of a welfare state that protects people in more ways than just guaranteeing a basic income. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is, you know, this is, this is very important. People still don't have that clear. I mean, you know, complex social security system operate on different levels and the basic income will uh, uh, basically 
if applied, get integrated within a structural protection that cannot disappear. I mean, there are very different ideas of basic income in itself. You know, you, you have even Milton Friedman at some point has advocated basic income as a negative tax. So, you know, a, a lot is dependent on, on the levels of this basic income, how it gets integrated uh, to other policies. But I think that the COVID crisis has shown that when there are huge crises, especially in a country like the United States, where the net of social protection is very uh, limited, the fact of having a policy that is there and automatically supporting income could be very, very important. Because I mean, at the end of the day, if you look what has happened in the United States, it's basically uh, that a lot of checks have been sent around uh, for people over a conjunctural moment of crisis. This is not a social protection. You know? This is not a way of developing social rights. Uh, uh, this is just, you know, uh, you, you, you are it's just a one time deal. Exactly. Exactly. One time deal. Uh, vote for Trump. Get, you know, here's a check. Vote for Trump. Make him popular. Big daddy. Big bully. And no, so, you it's, know, not a, it's, it's not a policy uh, created by a democratic public. And so, you know, I mean, this is, this is in a way, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it hasn't pushed any, any debate further. I mean, if you compare the reaction between Europe, uh, uh, many European countries in the United States, I think it's very instructive in the role of the welfare state. I mean, in Europe, automatic stabilizers stepped in. So when there was the crisis, a lot of people went into automatic stabilizers in, in terms of unemployment benefits, uh, 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 technical unemployment. I mean, in France, 12.4 million people have been supported uh, over time through that. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's a completely different uh, 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 case in point in which uh, people are a lot more insured. But, but, I would, you know, underline that many of the issues that we see at the economic level are common uh, between the United States and, and Europe. I think that in Europe, we have probably more social protection, but also the level of the grievances is very, is very strong because this protection, they cannot, they've been weakened over time and they cannot uh, uh, fully cover people uh, uh, in, in a period, in a, in a protracted period of wage stagnation and, 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 and precarization of, uh, of the labor market. And now with a pandemic, that's much, much worse than pre precarity uh, or globalization. Uh, it's dramatically worse. I wanted to make another point about basic income. And that has to do with the kind of capitalism that we all live within, which is consumer capitalism. Uh, we live in societies where the economy depends on, and our psyches depend on, goods, stuff, having a lot of stuff, buying a lot of stuff. And I think that the uh, prospects of a basic income and of the prospects really for a kind of utopian reconstruction of our social life are greatly enhanced if we begin to think about the possibility of purging this part of our psyches and this part of our culture, the part that so much depends on grabbing and consuming and destroying stuff. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very big prop of our existence now, and it is also a big obstacle to reforms like basic income, because basic income will not allow us to be cargo cultists in the way that we have been. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, this, you know, we, the problem of the way in which the economy is set up in terms of consumption, I mean, for me, uh, uh, staying for four months in row in the United States was a shock. I mean, we, we are very consumeristic in Europe, but I mean, what, what goes on in the United States? And I mean, and this has been fostered. People have been educated to consume, uh, not because of the need, uh, 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 but because of uh, the necessity of the economies are. You know, I think I would add up another point to that that is more general. We basically live in an economic system and we believe that we need to feed an economic system beyond our needs. So the, the point is, we don't feed, you know, we, we don't have an economic system that serves our needs and our purposes, but we need to operate in order for an economic system that has become schizophrenic, uh, incapable of not damaging the planet going on. 
as I think, you know, it, 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 it profounds colors into question. Here today is not only a problem of protecting poor people, it is not only a problem of, of resetting up economics and, and, and paying people real wages, but it's also a problem of uh, um, setting up and allow next generation to live in a world that is still livable. And, and, and this, I think, you know, it's, it, it's, it's deeply entrenched to the kind of economic policy and the kind of social policy that we will observe in the future. Today, uh, many people in governments are not considering that. I mean, look at the reaction at the end of the lockdown. It was to suddenly restart flights. I mean, here in France, in France, uh, the government's financed with 7 billion euros, Air France. I mean, one, one might legitimately ask, why not investing this 7 billion euros in creation of different kinds of jobs, you know, of green jobs, of, of different kinds of things, and, and, and exploit this crisis to kind of shift things in a different direction from an economic point of view. Same applies to motor car industry. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the justification for that was we need to defend these jobs. Uh, but, you know, uh, once, once uh, certain industries are damaging the planet so much, perhaps, you know, uh, we need to reinvest that. And so I think that a lot, of, a lot of the things that we are discussing at the social policy level are also interlinked uh, uh, with a lot of debate that we need to have in terms of industrial policies and in terms of what we want to do um, uh, with our future. So we need to revive, on at least a modest scale, the kind of utopian thinking that flourished around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, what, after all, is a good life? Is it shopping? Is it getting more stuff to put in a storage place that you rent? Uh, you know, our, our cities in the United States are now surrounded by highways which are bordered by huge warehouse complexes and by storage facilities so that people can keep buying and put their, the stuff that they buy in storage because there's no room for it in the tiny apartments that they are able to afford in the cities. We live a crazy, crazy life. And cer certainly something better is possible. We ought to begin to think about that and to depict it, depict it and to sing about it and to celebrate how we could live a different way. We could live amidst greenery, we could breathe clean air, we could cook good food, and we don't need a lot of stuff to do that. Um, we, have another, we have another question, uh, Professor Piman. I'm just gonna read that, it's in the chat. I'm watching this debate from France. Uh, the coronavirus crisis has brought to the forefront in our country the indispensable role of invisible work with low wages, mostly women who are the most exposed to the risk of the pandemic, such as nurses, hospital staff, caretakers of the elderly, supermarket cashiers, cleaning workers, etc. In the daily lives of the invisible workers, it opened up a very important debate on the link between utility and recognition in terms of salaries. What do you think? Well, yes. we both agree <laughs> with the question. Uh, the questioner, and we think that uh, this improved, if not utopian society that we should press to create, that we should exert ourselves to create, should reward care workers rather than production workers. Uh, it's okay not to have as many steel workers. It's okay not to have as many workers in the automobile assembly lines. We need more people to help take care of our children, uh, to help take care of our disabled and our elderly, and we need more people to make public spaces amenable, clean, wholesome. We need a lot of things in our society, and they're going to be a lot of jobs for those who want them and can do them, and there should also be a lot of economic security for those who, for whatever reason, uh, cannot earn a living through that kind of work. Yeah, I, I also agree. And I, and I could add that 
if you look at the wages of people in the care work, they are usually penalized. So if you compare people with the same socio-demographic characteristics working in whatever sector and care workers, care workers tend to be the least paid people. And I think it is a problem, you know, economics justify that out of productivity. And this is an incredible conundrum and another example of how crazy we went with economics. So let's pick up the case of a caretakers. So if you want to be productive in a work, you need to do more stuff. So for a caretakers, it would be productive would be to help more people. But helping more people would be to do his job less carefully. Right. So in a way, the, the, the idea of productivity is admitted to work are highly labor intensive, where there is a dimension of relation uh, uh, between people, actually a high level of productivity, of social productivity, which means that these people are rewarded to take time to take care of people. And, it, and, it's in, and I think this crisis can be a, a blessing in disguise if we manage to finally recognize that these are the people that today we call essential workers. They've always been essential. And, and, and these people are at the core of our society is, and these are the people that we're actually not remunerating. These are the people who are at the bottom of the income distribution, and these are the number of jobs who are increasing the most. Uh, in whatever country you look in, in, in the Western world, almost 30% of people do forms of care domestic uh, works. And if we don't take care of these people, uh, inequalities will continue to increase. I think uh, we need to reinterrogate the notion of, of value and to uh, also abstract that for pure uh, uh, and abstract marginal economic, uh, economic thinking. And, and we can only do that if we recognize the value of these jobs. And I, you know, in a way, it, it's interesting that it's been happening a lot during this crisis. I've been doing quite a lot of work on care work before because I, I, I believe that this is so important. Just to give you another example. Today, everybody, I think here, besides what is your political ideology, would agree on the fact that childcare is important. Okay? Everybody goes on and on and on uh, uh, about, about childcare is very important, whatever. But childcare, childminders are among people with the lowest wages in comparison to their qualifications. So why if you estimate that the job is so important, uh, uh, we, 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 just, we just don't pay them uh, uh, properly for what they do? Uh, we have a follow-up uh, uh, question here. Your analysis of caretakers could be applied to teachers. It would be better to increase the number of teachers, pay them better and build more public school to have less students in classroom and therefore create better learning conditions for all students. Well, I don't think it's a question. I, I think, you know. We agree with that. We agree yeah. with that. But that doesn't mean that teachers should be... Uh, take care of little toddlers. We need somebody to take care of the babies and the toddlers as well. And we need somebody to take care of the old people and the disabled people. Uh, the question that that raises, however, it's a vision of work in a society that is no longer household work, family work, because much of the caring has always traditionally been done by women in the family, not for wages. So we have to think about and quarrel about and worry about whether it's necessarily a good thing to change all those functions so that they become wage work done by wage workers. Much of that has already occurred in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, do, is that the best model? I'm not sure, I'm not answering the question. I'm just raising it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I agree. It is, it is, it is, it is very, you know, it is, it is very important. I, I, I don't know if, uh, I think we need to bring the talk to a close. I don't know if we don't have any signal from, from the organization, but I, I think we, we can bring that to a close. I don't know if you, you know, if you, if Professor Piven, you want to conclude, you want to say something, and, you know, just wrap uh up. I want to conclude by saying that there's a tremendous amount of social and political work to be done in our societies. Uh, but I think we may have the opportunity to do that work and to make France, the United States, Europe, Asia, the South, better places to live in and places that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be able to live in. So 
the prospects for the future are not so bad as they were just recently before the great movement. Great. Well, I, I think if we don't have any more questions, um, that's a good place to end for today. So on behalf of the French American Foundation, thank you so much to both of you for joining us today and for sharing your expertise with the group, uh, especially in these unprecedented times as we move forward. Uh, so one quick note uh, that our next webinar in the series will be this Thursday afternoon with William Drozdiak of the Brookings Institution and Ambassador James Lowenstein of the French American Foundation to discuss Mr. Drozdiak's new book, The Last President of Europe, about Emmanuel Macron. Um, so thank you to everyone who joined us this afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.